How is his condition? Mikhail Lomonosov asked the doctor. Your son's health has improved considerably. Fortunately, the cold didn't turn into pneumonia, so you don't have to worry, Mikhail said, glad to hear that. Looking through the ajar door at the seated Ivan, he made a suggestion. Who knows? Maybe once he recovers, he'll immediately decide to leave here. Ivan was reading something in a book, and his father said he wanted to keep him here. Now he turned to the attending doctor. So keep it from him that his health is coming to normal. I won't hurt him with money. The doctor coughed and replied, I'll say I need to observe him for a month. Will that do? Mikhail said it would do, not bad. Turning back to his son, he issued the following. Daddy will definitely take care of you. Ivan. He sat with bags under his eyes and read a book, unaware of his father's intentions. The book and pen finally found peace. Yvonne slightly decided to rest, but without getting up from his seat. He was very tired. Suddenly a voice behind him was heard and asked, Are you torturing yourself like this or are you bragging? It was Leonard. He leaned over a little to draw attention to himself. He spoke again. I worked so hard to save you, so it would be a shame if you just died here. But Yvonne pretended not to pay attention to him and continued typing something on the laptop keyboard. Now he answered, it's to bring myself to my senses. Besides, this kind of exertion certainly won't kill me. Yvonne said that lying down all the time made his body ache. Leonard replied that he had heard Yvonne spending time in the library lately. He asked what he was doing so hard. Picking up his piece of paper, he replied that there was a lot going on in this Lomonosov mansion, so he would like to do a little check on the finances. Now he waved his hand and invited Leonard closer. Um, by the way, I wanted to tell you something. Could you come closer? Leonard didn't seem to be expecting this. What? Me? Leonard smiled sweetly and answered him. Looks like someone is finally ripe for a thank you for saving. But before he could finish, Yvonne punched him sharply in the stomach with all his might. He also noted that this blow was payment for the past. Trembling and not expecting such a thing, Leonard faintly asked, Payment? Didn't I save you this time? The answer he received was, You were rewarded for it but you still owed me a debt. From the street came the loud sound of a car. Yvonne turned to the window on this side and shuddered at what he saw. That car, Yvonne voiced. Still reeling from the blow, Leonard didn't notice Yvonne leaving the library at first. He asked him where he was going all of a sudden. Looking out the window, Leonard wondered what he saw out there. Seeing the black car at the entrance, he couldn't believe his eyes. Wait, really? The car door clicked open. A man got out. Lomonosov's men were at the entrance to the mansion. They began to talk, the clamor covered the street. Mikhail Lomonosov was waiting for him with his men at the entrance. There was indifference on his face. As Ivan was coming down, he saw his father. He froze. He had questions such as, how did this person... Ended up here? It was Dmitri, Caesar's cousin. How dare he show up here? He had a smirk on his face. Greeting Mikhail, he said to him, It's good to see you well, Mr. Lomonosov. And you still say things you don't mean at all, Dmitri. Lomonosov answered him. Why are you being so cruel? Aren't you happy to see me? Dmitri turned on a cheerful smile. Mikhail asked him why he was here. Dmitri began to explain to him in order. You probably know this, but the Sergeyevs are in a very precarious state right now. It would be great if you could lend me the power to stabilize the situation within the group. That's why I came to you. The people of Lomonosov began to discuss the news they had heard. The Tsar is dead and his men have gone mad. Will the Sergeyevs really end up like this? There was a reply from Lomonosov. You ask, but you have not yet said what you are going to offer in return. Of course I've made preparations. There's no way I'm going to let the deal not be mutually beneficial. Dmitri interjected. I am? Yvonne stepped forward confidently. His father was proud of him. Dmitri chuckled and added that it looked like his son was quite healthy too. The father smiled broadly at his son and turned to him. Yvonne Chick, you've heard everything, haven't you? What do you think of this proposal? The son replied that he was a stranger here, so his opinion was not important. Father insisted on it. But I'd still like to hear it. You know what? If I were to commission you to respond to this proposal as a lawyer, what advice would you give me? Yvonne confidently expressed his opinion. If it were my assignment, I would tell you that accepting an offer out of naked self-interest alone is only worthy of a snot-nosed child. The guest smiled evilly at him and decided to express his thoughts too. You don't seem to trust me, because I am only the second in command of the Sergeyevs. To which he immediately received a reply from his interlocutor. Even when visiting another country, the president should be greeted only by the president. With a glare, Yvonne enlightened him on the details of etiquette. According to etiquette, if one ventured to the head, they should have sent their ringleader to visit, 
The elder Lomonosov nodded in support of his son and responded to the suggestion like this. There you have our side's answer. I don't think Dmitri was expecting this. Good. Well, then negotiate with our head. And opened his arms. After these words, someone stepped in their direction, and people were talking. And they didn't realize what kind of chapter if King was dead. Rumors started flying right here in this room. Everyone was saying, have they named a new heir yet? Or is it really Sasha? Mikhail Lomonosov didn't understand either and wanted to clarify, wait, if this is a chapter... The door to the entrance clicked. Someone came in. Yvonne didn't expect him, and said as well, What else is this? But before he could finish, he saw a man enter and it shocked him. Oh, come on. He had blonde eyes and beautiful cheekbones. Even without looking into the man's eyes, Yvonne easily recognized him. Long time no see, the head said with a smile. It was Caesar. He looked absolutely alive, groomed, neatly dressed as always. At that moment, Yvonne's world collapsed. Up until that moment, he had thought it was dead. His thoughts were jumbled. He was confused and didn't know what to believe. Oh, King, what the... He's not dead. Am I dreaming now? Not wanting to believe his eyes, he pondered Leonard's last words. Suddenly he had really worked hard. Or had he already lost his mind, and this was just a vision of Caesar? Undeterred, Yvon uttered the first words, but could not fully express himself. Can I... Noticing this, his father interjected. Son, what did you want? Yvonne exploded. He shouted right on the spot. Can I have a little word with the king? As his lawyer, I have a couple recommendations for negotiations. He went up to the Tsar and grabbed his arm, taking him into another room. The elder Lomonosov wanted to stop him, but nothing succeeded. His lawyer? And me, Mikhail muttered after them. The door in the other room slammed shut. Caesar snuck his eyes toward Yvonne. The latter was angry, but so far silent. Finally, the king decided to speak. What is it? Why are we... But before he could finish speaking, as he turned to him, Yvonne grabbed him by the collar of his shirt and pulled him to him, saying, Hey, you! The king! Clenching his fist, Yvonne warned him, exasperated. Clench your teeth tighter! The last second before that, Yvonne looked him straight in the eye. And he cracked his fist so hard that the czar flew a few meters away. Staggering, he stopped at the sofa. Yvonne grabbed the king once more. Now the latter spoke up. Hold on, lawyer. Scumbag, Yvonne said, looking him in the eye. And he asked, did the king what, wanted to deceive him? Yvonne trembled as he said this. I've been all this time after this news. I, uh... Before Yvonne could finish, the king touched him, pulling him close and calling him to him. Yvonne slapped him again and told him to shut up. Yvonne thinks he's a lying scoundrel. Where the hell is he putting his hands? The king tolerated it, and silent, staring at his lover. I was so... worried, Yvonne said with tears in his eyes. The king noticed this and asked, Are you now crying? Yvonne began to rub his tears and denied it. I am not. You undone cheat. A crook? What are you talking about, is it? The king asked him. Removing his hands, the king clarified, You didn't know that everything that happened was a play? Uncomprehending, Yvonne interjected the last word. The Tsar explained that he had asked Dmitri to give this to him. Yvonne only replied that Dmitri had told him that the Tsar was dead. The king shuddered and asked, so you mean you thought all this time that I was... dead? Yvonne replied that he did. He was once again disappointed in his cousin. The king didn't expect him to do that either. He was silent. In a second, he was already mocking Yvonne openly. I can't believe you were so worried about me. It's not a bad effect. Those words pissed Yvonne off. Oh, you! And he made another fierce thrust. Is this how you think jokes are made? Yvonne shouted at him and wanted an explanation. The king gave a little moan of pain. Now Yvonne was paying attention. He hadn't hit him hard after all. Could this be a continuation of his performance? He realized what was wrong and voiced his thoughts. Ah, the wound hasn't healed yet. With a sharp single motion of his hand, he pulled open the king's shirt. What he saw amazed him. What is this? The king had a large wound that had not yet healed. It seemed to be the place where the knife had been stabbed. Yvonne asked him, since the king had said that what happened was just an act. Why isn't it healing? It was dangerous. The Tsar explained to him that if they wanted to run a mob, they had to play big. That's probably why Dmitri added the poison to the tip of the knife. It took a little longer to get it out of his system, he explained. Yvonne interjected, what kind of poison? Anyway, Tsar said he didn't trick him on purpose. He didn't even know Yvonne was here. Wait, then why did you come here? Yvonne asked the king. He wanted Lomonosov's army. He said he couldn't use his subordinates to get rid of traitors. If this conversation gets out, there'll be trouble. About you being... Alive? The king confirmed this and wanted to add more. About me killing them all. I'll kill them all. 
the king said with a grin. What do you expect from him? He says things like that and smirks. Typical mafioso. While Yvonne was wondering how he'd gotten himself involved with him, the king touched his cheek lightly. Making his way closer to him, he uttered, Thought you hated me. Yvonne noticed his hands shaking as he said this and touched him. Lowering his head, Yvonne relaxed and sighed heavily. Suddenly, Yvonne jerked sharply and demanded an apology from him. He pushed the king's hand away. Say it's your fault for that and, he used to say. Pressing his lips together, Yvonne fell silent. In short, ask for my forgiveness, Yvonne said, looking him in the eye. He remained silent for the moment. Looking back with the corner of his eye, the king was in thought. Lowering his eyes, the king replied as he apologized to him. I'm sorry. He finally uttered the cherished words. Yvonne looked at him with indifference and thought over his apology. Okay, Yvonne said. This stunned the king a little. Walking closer to him, Yvonne placed his head on his chest and said, Idiot piece of shit. Their hands touched, slowly touching, finger by finger. They clasped their hands together. They're together. The king lowered his head. He looked at his beloved. I touched his head and lightly pulled him to me. The king kissed him. A hot and passionate kiss. They stood in the middle of the room and melted into that kiss while everyone waited for them outside. Yvonne gave a little moan from the kiss. They were together at last. Looking into each other's eyes, they were glad they had finally met. Someone knocked on the door of the room and asked him with the words, Young master? And embarrassed to show it, Yvonne shoved the king away from him. He was embarrassed. I heard some sound. Are you all right? He asked him. Remembering the head of the mafia, Lomonosov's man shrieked, You're not threatened by Sergeyev? Yvonne denied it and assured him that everything was fine. Safely closing the door in front of him, Yvonne was afraid he would see everything. Young master, I'm opening the door, he shouted. Yvonne replied that nothing was wrong. The last one shuddered and answered him that everything was definitely all right. At this time, the king wasted no opportunity in pestering Yvonne. He lied to the man, saying, Just not fully recovered yet. Sprained my leg. Don't worry. Whispering, Yvonne told the king to move away from the door. Are you crazy? What are you going to do if we get caught? And he was angry, of course. I don't care, the king replied coldly. Yvonne was even more furious. Spit! You're in an enemy camp. One wrong step and you'll be in the other world. As usual, without finishing his words, he added the following. Anyway, don't throw around such dangerous words. I don't know, the king replied with a smirk. Kissing his lover's hand, the head of the Sergeyev's mafia uttered romantic words. If I die in your arms, I'll probably go to heaven. In between, Xar managed to bite his arm once, with a smile on his face as if obsessed with him. Then, while the king continued to kiss his hand, Yvonne simply watched him. The latter grabbed the king's thigh and jerked. They secluded themselves and began to work things out. It got colder outside. Slowly the snow was falling on the ground, Lomonosov. Lomonosov's man returned to the chapter. The elder Lomonosov asked him how Ivanchik was doing. The latter explained exactly what his son had said. It looks like our conversation with Caesar is going to go on for a long time. Please tell Mr. Lomonosov about it. He remembered Ivan's words. Concluding, he replied to the head. He asked me to tell you that their conversation will take a little longer. I see. Obviously, the son has some thoughts on his mind. Ivan isn't the type to step on the same rake twice, so don't worry about him. The elder Lomonosov replied. Crossing his arms, Dmitri hummed. The door clicked open just as Ivan and Caesar walked into the room, saying, Sorry to keep you waiting. His father approached him and asked if he had passed on the advice. Uh, advice? Yvonne interjected. Finally, the lawyer said what they had decided. Yes, it ended well. The Lomonosovs will also be able to get satisfactory terms from the Sergeyev's offer. Looking at the king, he uttered, Perhaps, well, that's good. I was a little surprised that you were defending the king, but I already knew that and I thought you had your reasons. These words from his father put Yvon in an awkward situation. The king, for his part, rose to Yvon's defense. He is a good lawyer. I've learned a lot from him, even during our recent conversation. I plan to continue to expand my knowledge, he added, and stroked Yvon's back with a hand that made him shiver. Gritting his teeth, Yvon looked at the king and quietly said, Enough. Caesar looked at him and just hummed. Then, Mr. Lomonosov, if you and I could have a private conversation... Mr. Lomonosov, Caesar suggested. Looking him straight in the eye, the head of the Lomonosovs replied, Hmm, if that's necessary, fine. They strode into the other room. A powerless Yvonne slumped in his chair, slowly sliding out of his seat. Dimitri sat down on the couch across from him with an awkward expression on his face and asked him how the negotiations had gone. Did you have fun? Yvonne got angry and replied that he wouldn't catch him this time. Sad. I barely survived and now I'm on death's doorstep. 
Dimitri was happy, but his mood changed abruptly. I think you realize that if you'd taken it seriously, you'd be dead. Without stopping talking, Dimitri grinned and made a statement. Say thank you. With my help, you're still alive. Yvonne thanked him judiciously. Hmm? Thought she'd still be pissed. Not the reaction I was expecting. Dimitri thought with a frown. Now it was time for words for Yvonne, and he asked him, I was told that this whole plan was set up by you and Caesar. Dimitri confirmed it. Yeah, to catch opponents. We trust each other, and we've been doing this kind of thing together for a long time. Yvonne said, however, things had turned into a complete mess. This was something Dimitri hadn't expected and asked again. What? Yvonne hummed and explained his point. Obviously you tried, so I won't say any more about what has already happened either. However, you might want to proceed a little more carefully in the future. I won't be a victim all the time. Dimitri isn't sure he should be hearing those words from him. The next words shocked Dimitri. You're hiding quite a fortune. Real estate and property formed when you served in the KGB. Hidden property in Germany and Switzerland, plus land in France and Japan. In addition, you also run secret clubs and are involved in the illegal distribution of narcotics and prostitution. He continued to say, I? Dimitri asked. No idea why I've been here all this time? I don't know why I've been here all this time. Yvonne snorted. Trying to humiliate him, Dimitri replied, I was just afraid I'd die if I figured it out. You're a pussy. Yvonne said that was the wrong answer. Still, Dimitri wondered where he was going with this. I guess you wanted to believe that I was hiding out here because of fear, Yvonne noted. He explained that the real reason was different. It just had everything he needed. He turned out to have gone through all the papers that contained material on illegal funds, as well as dirt on the individuals he needed. What's more, there's even information here about how long you wore diapers until you were about six years old. Yvonne grinned at Sergeyev. Dimitri looked at him coldly and said, You... Yvonne explained to him that he thought he had betrayed Caesar and he was beginning to prepare for revenge, but he would put it aside for now. Dimitri hadn't done everything right, of course, but he'd tried. Glittering with joy, Yvonne noted that next time, it was better not to make any mistakes. Someday I will definitely finish you off. The man began to coldly threaten. Try it, but you'll be a beggar quicker. Yvonne replied confidently. Suddenly there was a rumble. It was Dimitri. He rose from his seat and walked away from Yvonne. The door to this door clicked open. A redhead appeared. Leonard appeared in front of Dimitri. It made Sergeyev flinch. Dimitri looked at him and tisked. They exchanged glances, but they didn't say anything. Hmm. I wondered why he was trying so hard, Leonard remarked. Yvonne told him, don't you know it's rude to eavesdrop on other people's conversations? Leonard modestly responded to his words. That's the instinct of a sniper. I'm just a genius. Although Yvonne was aware of his ego, he was annoyed that he was proud of it. So we were together for a reason. You don't disappoint me after all. I'm pleased. Leonard continued and plopped down in the chair. Glad you had fun, Yvonne told him. Then the sniper started fumbling around in his pocket with the words, As a thank you for bringing the fun. Finding what he needed, handed it to Yvonne. A card of some sort. This is... Yvonne guessed and held out his hand. The latter's hands were shaking. It was a business card with Leonard's number on it. Call me if you need me, the sniper said. His next words sounded confident and dangerous. I'll kill anyone. Accepting his business card, Yvonne involuntarily thought about his last words. Ah, okay, why does everyone around me want to smash someone? Leonard was already getting up from his seat, intending to leave, but added this. Oh, and one more thing. Smiling and winking at Yvonne, Leonard coquettishly announced. You're the first person I'm giving this number to. Singing a cheerful song, a pleased Leonard left the place. Yvonne wondered, what's next? At that time, the head of the Lomonosov and Sergeyev families left to discuss the deal. They went to a separate room to be alone. Mikhail Lomonosov was the first to speak. What did you want to talk about? Caesar stated something bold to him that surprised the head of the mob. And you're brave to say such things to me, Mikhail emphasized. The man only hummed, saying nothing in response. Meanwhile, the airport was full of airplanes coming into this city. It looked like the Sergevs were waiting for someone. One of them was standing by the limo, constantly looking at his watch. He should be here any minute, he said. Several people were also waiting along with him. After a few moments, someone stepped towards them. Seeing him, the Sergeev's man greeted him. Ah, hello, Sasha. The man said nothing in reply, but only hesitated. Hmm, well, what are you doing here? Asked a tall and statuesque man with a patch over one eye who looked a lot like someone. Exactly. He resembled Caesar. So this was the current head of the Sergeev family, Caesar's father. One of the men would open the car door for him, and the other would explain to him, Ah, uh, this is... We were waiting to escort you from the airport. 
Interesting, the man said as he got into the car. The man sat down in the driver's seat. But before he could move, he started asking questions to the man. Sasha, you've probably already heard about everything along the way. But to tell you the truth, there's been a lot of chatter going around the organization. The driver looked at the rearview mirror and saw Sasha's reflection in it, who was also looking at him. There are rumors that Tyuchev killed the Tsar. So, the head listened to him. Is he dead? After this question, the driver began to shake. Getting no answer from him, Sasha asked again. I asked, is the Tsar definitely dead? I asked, are you sure the Tsar is dead? Sasha inquired. Oh, that. As far as I know, no one has seen the body. I also wanted to make sure, but I was prevented by Mr. Dimitri. The driver finally answered. Looking at the same mirror, he expected to see Sasha's reaction to the news of his son's death. But he was disappointed because... What a laugh, Sasha said with a smile and turned to the window. Sasha said with a smile and turned to the window. Yeah, roger that. We'll be waiting, Tyuchev said to someone. A, he'd just gotten off the phone with the people who'd met Sasha. Soon he hung up. Sasha's back. Yuri is driving him from the airport now, Tyuchev muttered. Sergei's men seem to be organizing a meeting. Tyuchev has told them there's no turning back. They'll have to make it happen. Shaking their hands, Tyuchev spoke hysterically to them. Of course, I will not forget the kindness of the comrades who shared my thoughts. But in fact, his thoughts were quite different. After I am recognized as heir and subject to repression all those who do not want to obey, he said, I'll become the second person in the Sergeyev family. He thought out his cunning plan in his head. His expression changed dramatically and he assumed an intimidating grimace. The image of the Tsar appeared in his mind, his arrogant smile with which he looked at Tyuchev. At last, he thought back to how much he'd had to put up with that boy. Looking at the people around him, he reasoned, I'm not sure if I'll be able to easily persuade Sasha after the death of my offspring. But these types are 100% on my side. From this many people, even Sasha will feel the pressure. While Tyuchev continued to think about the situation, the other people were talking rumors. One of the Sergeyev's men publicly questioned, But why isn't Dmitri here? He was immediately answered by another person. Forget it. Someone who is not even in the leadership will only spoil the situation. He was also in agreement. Now they were questioning him. Tyuchev, are you sure about today's case? There are still many of Sasha's supporters in the organization. You'll have to try harder. Such questions certainly irritated him. Everyone sat down at the table and continued talking. After all, he is the Tsar's father, so we must not neglect his abilities. I wish, of course, that I had never seen Sasha again for the rest of my life. The gnashing of Tyuchev's teeth was heard. He was ready to explode with anger. And yet, he had already exploded. Why are you all tucking your tails in? You and I are already in the same boat. I'll get the boss's permission and become the heir. And after that, we'll all together restore the former glory of the organization that the king destroyed. The people sitting there didn't seem to believe him anymore. And he kept yelling, Get a grip! A man came up and reported that Sasha was getting out of the car. This news sent shivers down Tuchev's spine. A second later, someone's footsteps were heard in the hallway, heading for the door. The door of the room clicked open. With a menacing look, Sasha entered the room. People were whispering, trying not to miss the rumors, and Sasha slowly made his way to the table. Tyuchev looked at Sasha with hatred. They met gazes. Sasha only gawked in response. Hmm, he thought. There seems to be a lot of empty seats. Were his first words, pointing to the empty chairs. He was immediately answered, Some are not feeling well. We informed them of your arrival, but they still... Here Tyuchev joined the conversation. That's why it's not easy to run an organization. In addition, sometimes there are unfavorable incidents, he said, as if alluding to the last incident with the Tsar. The people also continued his words and proposed to choose a new head of the Sergeyevs. It is necessary to choose an heir. Let's decide on a new head. If you will not reoccupy this place, Sasha. Sasha said nothing after that. He just didn't say anything. He was asked why he was silent. Then he replied, So who do you want as your heir? Tyuchev seems to have been waiting for these words that he immediately jumped up from his seat and loudly uttered these words. All agreed that I should take this place. After calming down a bit, he looked Sasha straight in the eyes and said, So, I ask your permission. Sasha remained silent for the time being. Or rather, I was considering his words. All right, I'll allow it, said the Tsar's father at last. Tyuchev did not expect such an easy decision. What was the catch? Why did he agree so easily? He saw those faces and began to explain. The most important thing in an organization is power. 
If you are the most powerful among the current leadership, then fine. If you stole the position by force, of course it should be yours. I recognize Tyuchev as my heir, Sasha repeated to everyone. Tyuchev could not believe his ears. He was trembling all over and said, It worked! Abruptly rising from his seat, he began to thank him. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. The organization is in my hands now. I am king here, thought Tyuchev at once. Suddenly he heard someone's voice behind him saying, If the strongest should become king, it will be me. Tyuchev froze. Turning to the man behind him, he said, This one? The voice! Tyuchev finished. A familiar face appeared at the threshold. Has the Tsar appeared? His eyes, the same as his father's, looked at Tyuchev bloodthirstily. The king appeared in front of everyone, safe and sound, and most importantly, alive. The people in the leadership were confused. Tsar! How? He is! The king sat down in his chair and sweetly said, So, let us begin our meeting anew. Picking up the papers from the table, he read their contents. What do we have on the agenda today? A change of air? That's odd. There's me. I'm not sure we need to discuss this matter, he said confidently and with a sneer. Tuchev could not believe his eyes. It's impossible. How could someone who is already dead appear? It's some kind of conspiracy, or else, said Tuchev. He was interrupted by the Tsar, now turning to him. Tuchev, do you know what I learned first of all when I began to prepare myself for the role of heir? The Tsar's next words put Tuchev in a state of shock, to check whether your enemy is definitely no longer breathing. A clamor of people started around them. Did, did, Dmitri trick us? Abruptly, one of them began to justify himself to the Tsar. Tsar, we know nothing. It's all the intrigues of Tyuchev and Dmitri. We were in complete ignorance. Please believe me, they said. Tyuchev looked at them in defeat, as if they were traitors, trying to find a way out of this situation. Tyuchev thought this. Useless idiots. In that case, there is only one way out. After these words, he shouted across the room, Hey, come in! Suddenly, a crowd of men with guns in their hands burst into the room. They surrounded the Sergeev's men. Pointing guns at them, the men were ready to shoot them all. The members of the leadership squeezed into the center of the room, stepping back. Tuchev, you... what are you doing? One of them asked. Fumbling in his pockets, Tuchev tried to get something. He said that he wanted to settle things peacefully. But this boy had kicked him in the butt again. Members of the leadership demanded that they put down their weapons. Tell them to put their weapons down now. You're threatening us now, too. Tuchev drew his gun and pointed it at the Sergeyev family, saying, Now I don't care whether you live or die. Loading his gun, he threatened the following. I will finish off everyone here and take the organization for myself. Looking into the eyes of his father and the king himself in turn, he laughed. Even the boss himself can't squeak in front of a gun muzzle. There was indifference in the family's eyes, as if they encountered such a thing every day. Tuchev was laughing hysterically and could not choose whom he should get rid of first. With a hum, he also stated, Right, I really wanted to see the fear on that arrogant face. Yeah, first you... He finally pointed the muzzle of the gun at Sasha. He didn't even move. Goodbye, Sasha. You've done a great job. Tuchev said with a smile on his face. Dad was quiet. He seemed to be having a little fun. He had a smirk on his face. The rattle of the gun was heard across the room. He pulled the trigger. The loud sound of a gunshot. Bang! Tyuchev didn't realize what happened. He heard the shot, didn't he? But Sasha was also sitting on the chair, or rather alive. One man falls next to Tyuchev, the one who was at his side with a gun. A body slumped to the ground. He was shot. That's right, right in the head. Who shot that? I didn't give any instructions. Tyuchev shouted and tried to find out. But there was a bullet mark on the window. It was Leonard. The sniper hit his target with precision. He was on the roof of another building. Loading his rifle once more, he muttered, well, let's move on. It's easy. And a series of gunshots began. People were screaming, frantic, trying to escape and running. But the bullets hit many of them. One of them sat up and hid under the table, saying, Ah, help. Next to him, people were dying and their breathless bodies were lying on the ground. Chuchav, too, was hiding somewhere and was confused. But damn it! At what point? Everyone counterattack! What are you for? Chuchav said. But when he saw the breathless bodies of his men, he did not finish his words. My elite squad, Tyuchev barely uttered. His elite squad was shot in a second. The voice of the king was heard calling him. They were coming straight to him in a crowd. Smiling, the king asked him, Is that all your men can do? There was mockery in his voice. How pathetic you are. I'm sorry, he continued. The Tsar stood in front of him and said that he was even bored to contend with him. Behind him stood the Sergeyev's men, 
Through the blood on the floor, one man was crawling towards the king with the words, King! Thank you. Thanks to you, I'm alive. Condemn Tiochev. He is a traitor. The king fixed him with his gaze. He said nothing back to him. Tiochev, out of desperation, pointed the muzzle of his pistol at the Tsar, saying at the same time, May you at least die then. The men behind the Tsar raised their pistols and pointed them at Tiochev. The clicking of several guns was heard at once. Bang, 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 they immediately fired on Tiochev. And they shot the other survivors too. That's it. Silence. The sound of gunfire stopped. The king stepped closer to him. Tiochev was lying on the ground and bleeding. He said his last words. Cursed puppy. In response, the heir would only say, commendable effort, smiling at him. Taking a pistol in his hands, he pointed it at Tiochev and said that he would execute all traitors for it according to the method of the Sergeyevs. Pulling the trigger, he fired. With a creak, Sasha got up from his seat and asked his son, Well, did everything go according to your script? Glancing at the lifeless bodies of the traitors, the king replied that he seemed to have caused him trouble. But as the saying goes, for the sake of a new beginning, one must cast off all the old. New leadership in a new organization. Is that what you mean? Sasha voiced as he passed through the bodies of the dead people. Clapping his son on the shoulder, he continued, Then we'll have to watch what you build. The rest of the people lined up in two rows, making a corridor for Sasha. The one at the end said this, I don't think coronation is necessary. The Tsar hummed. He remembered his conversation with Mikhail Lomonosov, what he had said to the latter. I require an army of Lomonosovs. To which Mikhail said, And you are bold since you can say such things to me. And what do I get out of it? Something precious and unique to the whole world. The entire fortune of the Berdyevs, replied the Tsar. Lomonosov clucked. Ha, taking back what you took away? Do you think I'll accept such an absurd proposal? The king replied that he hoped so. You have a lot of confidence. And what is the reason for such faith? Michael asked. And he was answered, In that it is your son's work. Michael's hand trembled a little. The Tsar said that all the documents are ready and awaiting a court decision. He also had no doubts about the outcome. Of course, he assured that all procedures were carried out legally. Senior Lomonosov smiled a little and once again said, Look how brave you are. The king walked out of the room where the shots had just been fired. The door was open for him and he walked quietly down the hallway. As behind the door, Ivan appeared with another of the Sergeyev's men. The king walked up to him and embraced him with the words, Looks like you've been waiting for me. Don't talk nonsense. How's it going in there, sorted out? Yvonne said, pushing him a little away from him. Sa, uh, yes, the king replied briefly. He smiled and looked at him with loving eyes. Clinging even more to him, Xar hugged him, telling him it was over. Yvonne tried to free himself. The next day was morning time. Someone was running to get somewhere in time. It was Yvonne. Glancing furiously at his watch, he fidgeted nervously. Why, as luck would have it, did the streetcar break down one stop before the exit? Well, no. We're thinking positive. We need to accelerate the pitch to 10 m per s, he thought. Suddenly a car stopped on the side of the road and a man got out of it. A tall man appeared in front of him, his face obscured by the sun. Yvonne walked at a brisk pace and thought, No, I won't have time to stay. Squinting his eyes, he thought he was about to crash into this man. He was suddenly grabbed and pinned in an embrace. It was Caesar's embrace. Yvonne hadn't realized how he'd gotten into them. The one only hummed proudly. You always throw your whole body at me. The king was the first to start the dialogue, and he said it with a smile. Yvonne blushed and replied, There's nothing to keep blocking the road, he said with a sullen look. The king laughed sweetly and asked where he was going, or he might let him down. Hearing this, Yvonne happily handed him a folder of documents with the words, Oh, here you go then. Up the road. House 34. That's my client. I'll come to see him tomorrow at three o'clock in the afternoon. Tell him to read all the documents before then, Yvonne explained. After handing him everything, he ran away joyful and thanked the king. The latter didn't seem to expect it. He couldn't stop him. Until he uttered these words. And I made reservations at the restaurant, Yvonne paused. Next, Yvonne ran away and the king was saddened by this. Nothing changes, his phone rang. He looked at the phone screen. It was Yvonne calling him. He smiled sharply and picked up the phone. With a calm voice, without giving the appearance of having done so, the king asked him, did you forget something? Tonight at seven o'clock in the evening, Yvonne answered him. Glancing at his watch, Yvonne on the other side of the line continued to speak. I have about an hour of free time. The king hummed. He was pleased with him. Great. I look forward to it, the Tsar said and kissed the phone screen. On his phone, Yvonne was listed as lawyer. Tapping the phone screen with his lips triggered the call to drop. A moment's silence. The king stood like a stumbling block 
After thinking about Yvonne's last words, he smiled and hummed. Ah, how lovely. The king suddenly realized something. A car arrived at the Sergeyev's mansion. Several people met them. It was snowing outside and the snowstorm was heavy. The car door clicked open. One man opened the door for them. Getting out of the car, Yvonne was cold. And he started to complain a little. Brr, it's freezing. Where the hell did this blizzard come from? He was wrapped in a scarf, but he was still cold today. The Tsar and a few of his men were watching him. It was warm during the day. Did that cold from hell discourage you from going out with me at all? He asked Caesar, shivering in his seat. Proudly raising his head, the Tsar's response was, Don't fake it. The restaurant was in the building. All the more reason for you to choose your own time, the king continued. In passing, he recalled how Yvonne had called him, Seven o'clock tonight. You haven't forgotten, have you? Looking at his watch, you could have rescheduled it. Yvonne arose. No, replied the king briefly. Instantly glowing with happiness, the king went on to say, I'm afraid I've missed my lover too much. He had his coat on his arm. He brought it for Yvonne. While the latter was trembling and worried, How can you so easily say that? The king covered him with this coat, smiling with the words, Are you cold, my sweet? I think we should take a hot bath together, Tsar suggested. Yvonne was even more worried about the privacy of their relationship. What's the matter with you, for God's sake? Are you having fun? Do you want to tell the whole neighborhood about our relationship? The king teased him. Hmm, that's an idea. Just try it, Yvonne replied with a frown. Yvonne walked away, muttering to himself, God, standing outside his own home, sure, but at least look at how many people are around. Hearing him mutter, the king repeated his words, Home. Finally, he turned toward the mansion. True, this place is my home, but I can't call it home, the king said, looking at his home. He remembered how he had crawled here alive after the kidnapping, and his father, standing at the threshold, had said the following to him. You must learn to survive on your own. Sasha's voice was cold. The Sergiev's men stood behind him and looked at this picture. A little boy came home and heard such a thing from his own father. The boy who survived cried and sat by the snow. Someone called his return a mistake. At this point, however, the place's was the only refuge he knew of. There was smoke coming from the muzzle of the gun. In the middle of the room among the corpses stood the king. He was wearing one robe, which was bloody. Opening the doors, the people came running to the king. Tsar, we heard gunshots. Are you all right? They asked. I tell Dimitri, the Tsar said. There were traces of blood on his face, too. Clicking his gun, the king said he would look in on him soon. As he looked at the men he had shot, he pondered the situation. It's obvious to a fool whose handiwork this is. They wanted to attack while I was asleep. Judging by this idiotic on-the-fly behavior, they've already run out of original ideas for killing. He found the mirror behind him, and looking at himself, he wondered how much longer he could stand it. Turning to his reflection, he saw blood all over his body and thought, I should take a shower. Returning to the present day, the king reflected, At first I thought that day was terrible. An invidious nighttime assassination attempt. A dreary-sounding psalm. He recalled people singing. When he stood in front of the psalms in the temple and listened to them sing, and afterward, a familiar voice addressed him. Ho! Oh, I don't believe my eyes. What a coincidence it was. The head of Lomonosov's family showed up here too. I didn't know you went to this temple. The Tsar addressed him. The latter replied that he looked much more unnatural in such places. There's also a meeting with an old fox. Faith is an extremely important thing, for certain classes especially the Tsar added. Meanwhile, Lomonosov's men were pulling weapons from their pockets. Mikhail Lomonosov looked straight into the Tsar's eyes and reminded him that Sasha had lost one eye here. The king also looked at him without taking his eyes off, agreeing with him. A terrorist attack with a bomb. It looks better than the pathetic attempt to kill me in my sleep, the Tsar said, which made the elder Lomonosov shudder. The king came closer to him, and after standing next to him, he said that he would wait for a more interesting option next time. Turning, he left the temple, and Michael remained standing and watched him go. He turned to his man. Lion, let us dispense with foolish methods that will only alarm him. The man was desperate and said, I have no excuse. Come on. I knew I should have killed him the first time he was kidnapped. The head of the family said and left the temple. Now these are the memories of Mikhail Lomonosov himself, specifically what he thought of Caesar. Now that he has turned into a real monster... It has become much more difficult to guess the right moment. Or should the monster be called Sasha, who made Caesar like this? Mikhail pondered. A picture appeared before his eyes, where Caesar was completely bloody and with a saber in his hands in the middle of the forest. 
In Lomonosov's opinion, Sasha is a beast who made the child lose his humanity by cornering him. He cannot believe that Sasha sent his son straight into the clutches of death. For him children are a treasure, which is considered expensive for the mere fact of existence. Trying not to think about it, he squeezes his eyelids shut. Mikhail was currently sitting in the car and thinking about it. On second thought though, I have no right to judge. Now remembering his lover and Yvonne's mother, he decided, I guess we'll never see each other again, but my child won't live such a dirty life, and he won't have to face that monster. Realizing this safety for his son, he opened his eyes and uttered, At least something is happy. If I had a daughter, I'd have to hide her safely somewhere, realizing that such a man exists in the same world as her. I'd have to hide her somewhere, realizing that there was such a man in the same world as her. Thank God a son was born. He smiled and the car stopped. Next, the Tsar returned to his thoughts. I thought that after the unpleasant encounter with the cunning old man, nothing unexpected would happen again that day. But it wasn't to be. He and Dmitri were chatting on the phone. He shouted that he had missed the spectacle. Ha ha ha. Did he really want to kill you like that? Is he immortal or just stupid? And I told you we should put cameras in your bedroom. Every time I'm disappointed that I'm missing out on such a sight. I think I've already pleased you enough with the subcutaneous chip and the wiretap, the king said to his brother. Dimitri explained to him in his own way. That's not the point. I realize you've never let your guard down, but things happen. His words were interrupted by the Tsar. Enough. I'll talk to you when I get back. That didn't stop Dimitri. Don't be such a nerd. Think seriously about cut. And the Tsar just hung up. Caesar thinks it's more likely that Dimitri won't let up until he agrees. It's a perfectly normal obsession of Dimitri's. Back then, the Tsar was hoping to make this pointless day. He wanted the day to end soon. He stood in the corner looking for his cigarette. Behind him, Yvonne ran to the meeting, the very first day they had met. Frowning his eyebrows, he quietly muttered, If I just kill all the enemies, will it make me feel better? He thought about it until the moment that happened. The king went out into the corner and decided to go there at once. He thought about it until one unscheduled incident occurred. He stood back as Yvonne hurried and ran to meet him. Yvonne couldn't stop himself and bumped into Caesar. The man turned toward him, and before he did, for a brief moment he thought it was the end. He even imagined a knife going into his stomach now, or a bullet piercing his heart. However, none of this happened. On the contrary, he looked at the stranger and grabbed him so Yvonne wouldn't fall. They met that day for the first time. Yvonne squeaked a little. My nose, my nose. Hey, the king said. You didn't hurt yourself? He asked him. They looked at each other. Yvonne replied that he was fine. While Yvonne asked him to let him go, the Tsar thought about his unusual appearance. Not quite Asian. Matus? Hmm. My type. Yvonne also apologized. I'm sorry if I suddenly caused you injury. But those words didn't bother the king. Then he had a manic thought. Maybe I should just kidnap him and sleep with him. Then, coming back to reality, he replied that he was fine. Frowning slightly, Yvonne told him, Fine. Well, I have urgent business, so I... But he was interrupted by the king. How about wearing sunglasses? Yvonne didn't know what he was talking about. The king, touching the stranger's face, he spoke caringly. Snow is not uncommon in our lands. The ultraviolet rays reflected from it can ruin your eyesight. Yvonne shuddered. Removing the king's hand from his face, Yvonne replied confidently, Thanks for the advice, but I'm fine. Well, I'm off he said and went on about his business. It was a day that the king considered unlucky. The heir pulled out his cell phone and called. Yeah, something just happened here. M? Why did my mood skyrocket? No, it's nothing serious, he said with a smile. Eventually, it became momentous for Caesar. He answered the phone that just stumbled across something fascinating. He heard his name from far away. He finished remembering the first meeting and opened his eyes. It was Yvonne, it turned out, who called out to him. Why are you stuck out there? You stand there like a statue in the cold. You'll get sick. Taking up the coat which the king had given him, he looked at him, and in an orderly tone said to him, Stomp on it! That silenced Caesar. He seemed to be in a pleasant shock. Moving toward the house, the king replied with a smile, Coming. The house of the Sergeyev family. The weather has improved considerably. There is no more snowstorm and the sun is shining outside. Ivan and Caesar were having lunch. The Tsar had a newspaper in his hands. Yvonne told him they wouldn't be able to see each other for a month. He flinched. And asked why. He doesn't understand and asks for a reason. An urgent matter has come up. You're not the only one with a job, you know, Yvonne said. The king was silent for the time being. He looked at him with incomprehension. What took you so long? Caesar finally asked. The case is pretty complicated. I'll have to make inquiries and probably prepare for a trial. 
We'll still need to gather evidence to convince the man not to hold a trial at all, if possible, Yvonne explained. But he was interrupted by the Tsar. That's right, he asked again. Why a whole month? Why? Yvonne thought. He flashed anger, but couldn't say it out loud. Yeah, because at this rate I'm afraid I'm going to get a horse move from someone who has every time they see me. Put your hand on your healthy chest and rack your brain. He thought back to their active retreat and infuriatingly thought too. How do I know how else you're going to torture me? You think I'm going to tell you that I'm afraid of your endless energy and can't take it anymore? He held his head and didn't know what to say. Work is secondary. First thing you need is rest from all these bed nightmares. Now he dared to say this out loud. No, if I cut back on my sleep time, it'll be less. The king called out. Aye, came the next question from the king. And what and? Yvonne interjected. Caesar asked how many days specifically were needed for him. Be kind enough to answer, the mob leader added. Over Caesar's exertion, Yvonne couldn't concentrate enough to answer. Uh, twenty, Yvonne suggested, fearing his reaction. The king did not respond to his suggestion. He simply remained silent. His silence frightened Yvonne. He began to haggle in fear and offered fifteen days. But even this had no effect on Caesar. He also remained silent and threatened. There's nothing left of Yvonne. His face was gone. He had turned white. Jumping up from his seat, Yvonne shouted, All right, ten. I'll try to make it. Don't even ask for less. This figure immediately satisfied Caesar, and he was all smiles and glowing. That's good. Ten is ten. Yvonne, after so many months, came to his house. The birds were singing at the window, and everything was as it had been before. He went into his room, and it was a terrible mess. Things were scattered. Documents and papers were lying on the floor. Yvonne felt gloomy. It was as if no one had lived in this room for years. As he took in the paperwork, he couldn't stop thinking about it. Shit. As much as I think about it, why do I feel like I've put a good noodle in his ears? He found himself thinking, a month is overkill, but no, wait, what overkill? Why did you have to cut it short, even if it cost me one more bullet hole? His thoughts were interrupted by a voice. Counselor Zhang? The client asked him if something was wrong, and if everything was okay. He replied that everything was fine, he was just thinking. So, that's the end of it. One second, let me put the documents in the envelope. The client said. Yvonne answered her. There's really only 80% of the information here. I wish I could find all of it, of course. I'm sorry. He apologized to her. She only said that there was no need to apologize to him for that. Her husband had almost lost all the property, so she thanked him for his help. Accompanying her to the door, Yvonne said, Contact me if there are any problems. The client thanked again and they said goodbye. Closing the door, Yvonne faintly exhaled. Huh. Finished at last. This is the first time I've ever done a job with the idea of getting rid of it. Stroking his overgrown stubble, he looked at himself in the mirror and thought, I'm tired. I should take a shower. Or should I go to bed like this? He noticed a calendar by the mirror. Did I have any plans for the 15th? That's today, by the way. He glanced closely at the calendar. The 15th was marked with a red circle. Yvonne turned pale again. He had completely forgotten about it. He remembered how they had planned to meet Caesar on that date, since those ten days had already passed. He was horrified, for they had flown by so quickly. He was standing at the table, pale as ever. He was thinking of what to say to Caesar. Because of all my affairs, I lost track of time. If I say I forgot, Caesar may throw me into some wilds of Siberia, or lock me in a cellar. Sleep is no longer a problem. So, where do I start? I'm probably not very fresh right now. He thought about his current state. Disheveled hair on his head, bald stubble, rags, the shirt from no one knows when she's been changed. He realized he could use a bath. While trying to take a shower, he noticed that there was no hot water at home, only cold water. Why did the water decide to freeze in the pipes today? The public bar must be full of people like herrings in a barrel by now, Yvonne said and decided to go to the public bath. Yvonne said and decided to go to the public bath. Seeing the crowd of people and the long line to the bathhouse convinced him of his hunch. Did someone say Yvonne? Ah, yes. It was Nikolai, Yvonne's first client in this country. They said a friendly hello. No water at home either? Nikolai asked him. Yvonne replied that they all had the same problem. The latter asked Nikolai. By the way, it's probably going to be a long wait, isn't it? He replied. Lucky if the ones who have already entered aren't rabid washerwomen. The people standing in line turned to them and joined in on the topic as well. Huh. I don't know if we'll even have time to wash today. Another said, Hmm. Maybe we should just not wash for a day. I don't have anyone to show off to. The first one then said, Oh, really? 
What day? You could go a week like that. That's right. It'll be even colder after washing, said the man, and everyone laughed. Nikolai then added, They seem to want to privatize all the hot water. No way. Tell them to stop washing themselves. Ivan laughed and said, I guess yelling won't help the cause. But suddenly he stopped. His body shuddered. The front door to the bathhouse opened. A man came in through her. It was Caesar. He looked ravishing and handsome. He was holding a big bouquet of red roses. Yvon lost his breath from fear. Nicholas noticed this and asked him, Hmm? Yvon, what are you doing? It was like seeing a ghost, Nicholas added. And Caesar was annoyed by the bathhouse. For him, everyone was dressed like a bum. And then he saw Yvon in front of him. He too was in rags and didn't look ready for a date. Yvon took a black cat stand. The one that said, Stay back! Shoo! He didn't know where to find his place. What the hell are you doing here? I don't know, Caesar asked sharply, looking at his stubbled face. Yvon shouted in his defense. You didn't say you were coming to see me! And what's that on your hands? They stood there like stupors, not knowing what was going on. Yvon hadn't expected to see him here any time soon, and Caesar hadn't expected to see him in some bathhouse. The bouquet of roses fell from Caesar's hands to the ground. The Tsar was confused. How is all this? Understand. Covering his mouth with his hand, Yvon replied that the water in the pipes of his house had frozen, so he had to come here. The king aggressively clarified with him, What? You mean you were going to wash with all those types? The men who were in line felt guilty even though they did nothing. Yvon frowned and told him this. Well, clearly. Actually, that's how public baths work. And why do you make it sound like I'm doing something obscene? Yvon asked sullenly. While he was saying that he didn't give a shit about any of his fantasies and about how he just wanted to wash up before their meeting, Caesar grabbed Yvon's wrist. Covering his mouth with his hand, Caesar commanded him menacingly. Follow me now. They arrived at the Sergev mansion. Caesar brought Yvon to his private bathroom, where he could bathe in peace. But the man resisted. Stop it! Where are you dragging me? And why are you trying to take my clothes off? Stepping back, Yvon looked at him hysterically and said, Don't tell me that you were going to wash me. Caesar was silent. He grimaced as he helped remove Yvon's things. Well, no, I'll wash myself. Out the door, said Yvon. But that didn't stop the king. Don't be ridiculous. Take it down now, and took off Yvon's robe. He was wearing nothing, not even his underwear. Unable to reach him, Yvon voiced as if he were talking to a wall. Now the king spoke. You went there. Like this? Caesar asked him darkly and threateningly. He had a lot of jealousy in him. Yvon flinched at those words. He said, I thought I would wash up quickly and leave. And there was no time. Caesar looked at him with a hard look and ordered him. Don't go into that public shower room again, even if your pipes freeze to death. Better go straight to my place. If I see you in that place again, I'll poke out the eyes of everyone there. He said it without even blinking an eye. Yvon, for his part, was shocked. His jaw even dropped from him. What? Come out first, you idiot. He barely spoke. Caesar walked out of the bathroom, leaving Yvon alone with himself. He sank into the hot tub. I didn't realize he would drag me into his bathroom. Yvon thought about Caesar's actions and jealousy. He thought that, as usual, Caesar would first fatten him up in some luxury restaurant and then pounce on him as dessert. Yvon was surprised that Caesar didn't act according to his standard script and assumed that the case was that he was too dirty. Yvon couldn't relax and began to think, To be honest, I don't know where to go with Caesar at all. I have experience in relationships, of course, but it only involves girls. Unfortunately, it was his first experience with men, so he didn't know what to do. Because I'm meeting a guy for the first time, I have no idea what to do, Yvon thought. Yvon thought. He thought it was funny that he was even worried about this after all of Caesar's antics. Apparently, Yvon had problems too. He noticed Caesar approaching him in the bathroom. They soon secluded themselves here and sorted out their relationship. It was as if Yvon had already been in the darkness for ages. He was tired, and he barely spoke. Uh-uh, something's wrong. It seems like I've been running for days without stopping. He sat on the ground, greedily inhaling the air. He was sweating so profusely that sweat was pouring down his face and body. He wondered, why? Yvon saw a certain silhouette of a man in the darkness. If he is constantly running without stopping, then why doesn't this silhouette get farther away? It was as if he was waiting for his strength to run out. He somehow managed to get up from his seat and looked at the silhouette. It's not like a dream, because I can feel the fatigue and the cold all too clearly. And when I look at that strange figure, my scars start to ache. I feel that as soon as my thoughts get clouded, the creature in front of me will finish me off, Yvon thought. He feels pain. 
Why is he in so much pain all of a sudden? Suddenly, bullet wounds appeared on his body from all places at once. They bled and ached. What the? Yuck! Iwan said, not realizing where they had come from. He fell to the ground from so many wounds. What's going on? I didn't hear any gunshots, Yvonne thought. Trying to get up, he continued to reason. And the pain shot through in the same places. How could it be? Is it possible that I am reliving the events at the station all over again? Only in a dream? His foot slid on the snow and he wondered, Why of all the unpleasant memories, why this one? The thing is, did I intentionally try to erase that night from my memory? Now I have to go through it again. Yvonne began to guess at what was going on. He began to crawl through the snow, leaving a trail of blood behind him. And anyway, can a dream be so vivid, he thought. This is more like some kind of hell, Yvonne said, unable to cope with the pain and memories of that night. Behind him, a clearer silhouette resembling someone appeared. Yvonne began to guess. If it's exactly the same now as it was then, he turned to the silhouette. He turned to the silhouette, that dark figure. Yvonne looked at him. The silhouette had a gun in its hand. It was the figure of Caesar. The silhouette spoke to him. You already know, don't you? That you should have died at my hands? Caesar's silhouette finished speaking. Caesar, Yvonne shouted. He woke abruptly from the nightmare. He seemed to be screaming in the dream just as he was now. As he stood up abruptly, he got a headache. He was alone in the room. Holding his head, he remained silent. Yvonne contemplated the nightmare. That's not a pleasant dream, Yvonne said aloud, still holding his head. He looked up at the window and watched him. Maybe it's from sleeping in a new place? Where are my rainbows? Where are my unicorns? Yvonne said. He flopped down on the bed again, huh? He finally said it. I guess I got cut off in the process. The sun is already fading outside. Judging by the sky, it's sunset. I remember before I passed out, the sun was just coming up, Yvonne thought. Now it came to him how much time had actually passed. Wait, wait a minute. Don't tell me it's already the next sunrise, isn't it? Although with Caesar, that's possible. Caesar approached him from behind at that time. And he moved closer to Yvonne, kissing him gently with these words. I see you're awake. Yvonne didn't expect to see him anytime soon, especially naked. He jumped up from the bed and said, That's it, no more. Caesar interrupted him. Don't worry, I won't do it again. Here, have some water. Yvonne took the water and drank it with thoughts. Damn. And I also thought I was running from a cereal. Nope. The cereal is still there. It just knocked me out again. Caesar gently touched his back. And Yvonne thought, No, someday I'll definitely unscrew his bolt. Suddenly, Yvonne falls on the bed. He seems frightened. He and Caesar snuggled up on the bed. There was no extra movement. Caesar just lay there and hugged Yvonne. Told you to stop. I told you to stop. Yvonne mumbled as he was scared. Caesar immediately replied, I know, I really won't. Caesar's next words came as a shock and a blow to Yvonne. After all, you are very weak. What? You're hitting your pride because there's nothing else to hit? Yvonne asked. Caesar tried to explain. Well, he said, it's not like I tortured you. It's strange to lose consciousness while doing that. It means you're weak physically. Caesar finished. Yvonne was shocked and thought about it. I should rip your tongue out for saying that. There was violence. I'm the proof, and the fucking weapon is your gun. But he couldn't say it. Huh. Okay, let's say it wasn't violence. But did you ever think that tough men like me could faint too? Yvonne asked him. Caesar rose and replied that this had never happened to him. That's why I'm surprised at you every time, Caesar said with a smile. Yvonne was still thinking about his words. They say that sometimes even nonsense can become plausible, but I guess not in this case. Is he implying that I'm the one who's crazy? Why don't you think you're crazy? Are you saying I'm some kind of retard? Yvonne exhaled and asked the question that interested him. You haven't had it with other men? Caesar smiled and replied. That's a strange question. What do I do with them? That answer didn't satisfy Yvonne. You should have said you've slept with more than one. If I hadn't been the first, you'd be looking at a lot of men in the sack, he thought. And Caesar didn't understand his silence. Who knows, maybe then you'd shove your words up your ass? Yvonne thought. Meanwhile, Caesar knelt down in front of him and sweetly apologized. I'm sorry I never stopped. It was too much, wasn't it? Yvonne nods vigorously and nods. And would he apologize while sitting on my lap? Yvonne thinks again. Thinks then he covered himself with a plaid and lay down in bed thinking, though I doubt the word sorry exists in his vocabulary. I'm trying my best not to pass out, but it's the same thing all the time. Doesn't he even run out of stamina? Can't something be done about it? He lay there sullenly with these thoughts.
The only thing left to do is pump myself up? What if I drop out at this rate? He searched for a solution. Yvonne was silent and thought about it to himself. That's when Caesar called out to him, Yvonne, and put his arm around him, embracing him. Caesar came up behind him and started kissing him by the neck or collarbones while saying, I'll get you a trainer. Work on your stamina. Then you'll be able to hold on longer. Oh. Why would I go to all this trouble? It's like telling me to find someone else. Yvonne thought. Don't worry. I don't do it with anyone else but you. Caesar said softly and sensually. I'm getting good at holding back, Caesar said, still not letting go. And Yvonne felt the words hit her hard. For now, Caesar added later. They both fell silent. Each was thinking about something else. After a few seconds, Caesar got up from his seat and said, I'll tell them to get dinner ready, get changed and come out, and walked out of the room, leaving Yvonne alone with himself. Yvonne was silent. He looked to the sides and saw something. Shit, he muttered. On the table beside the bed were new, clean clothes and a watch. A new watch, apparently a gift from Caesar. The door to the hallway from the room opened. Yvonne came out in a good mood, like a fresh cucumber. He put on clean clothes and a gift from the Tsar. He thanked the Sergeev's employee for seeing him off. He glanced around the room. Caesar, Yvonne said. He sat pensively in his chair, waiting for his lover. He cast a glance at him and called him by name as well. Yvonne, uh, what have you been doing here alone? Yvonne asked him, to which he replied, admiring the collection. Caesar took his hand, pulling him to him. A collection? He finally turned his attention to the display case in front of them. A bunch of expensive fountain pens? I didn't know you collected them, Yvonne said. Caesar began to explain. My first collection. This, for example, is a limited edition Mont Blanc pen. I remember having a hard time getting it. He pointed to one pen. That pen over there was made by a master craftsman. Even the ink in it is custom made. Unfortunately, its maker is no longer alive, but that makes it feel even more precious. Yvonne found this interesting as well. I don't know much about fountain pens, so it's hard to get any comments out. Well, if you really like something, why not collect it? Yvonne thought. And Caesar went on to say, There was one pen a year. There are fourteen in the series in total. Wow, Em. Yvonne counted them, but there were fewer. But there's only thirteen. Didn't get one yet? Yvonne thought. Caesar hummed, and as if reading his thoughts. For a short time I managed to finish the collection. Yeah? What happened? Yvonne inquired. Caesar's next words sharply shocked Yvonne. One lawyer stuck the last pen into a chair. A sandal plaque, was that it? It must have cost a fortune. Yvonne was nervous when he heard that. What he said with fear was this. Well, you've got plenty of other pens. And Caesar pulled him closer to him, smiling. I was thinking I'd like to get a new pen from you. Caesar drawled to him. As a wedding present, Caesar finished confidently, holding Yvonne by the waist and looking him straight in the eye.